Hello there, and welcome to the Untitled Film Podcast with Callum and Johnny. What the hell was that? <laughs> I don't know, just felt like doing something different. I think he's gone bananas. <laughs> I think we broke him. What's going on this week, Callum? Um, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> <laughs> is my name even Callum? <laughs> it was quite funny. We were having just a normal conversation, and then I just did that, and I think it's really thrown Callum. And that, I... <laughs> so, do we have a podcast? An untitled one. It hasn't got a name. Untitled film podcast. Oh wow! Well, first, I'm hearing about it. Wow, well, indeed. So. We've had quite a popular week on the socials well, we this week. have, yeah. The world's most popular episode of Untitled Film Podcast online. Yeah, so hopefully it means... Well, we jumped it up in uh, followers a little bit. So we were at sort of, I think, mid-50s somewhere. And we're now at 73. Mm-hmm. And it's because we asked a question about film locations. But specifically, you were very recently on holiday. You went to Morocco. And it's uh, there where you went to see the shooting location that's been seen in many, many movies. You actually got the wrong location. Well, you got the right area of Morocco, but the wrong I was using the uh, Wikipedia page. Wow. Which uh, must be a bit wrong. The name, actually, of the... So, anyway, I I will fill in the blanks a little bit. So, in Morocco, there is this city, this kind of ancient city where people used to live. People still do live there, actually. There's about five families that still live in there. And the majority of what those families do is kind of caretake for it now and then they, they take show tourists around on the day off that's but cool it's this really kind of like cool mountain um in the, the kind of mountain city um that, that is kind of made out of um like mud and wood the buildings um so yeah it really kind of it looks really cool um to say the least uh, and they they've used it in films from like lawrence of arabia um and the but the Gladiator movies, spoiler alert, for the post, they've been used in the new Gladiator movie as well, and they're currently building the sets there. Um, and uh, name some other films that it's been in. You've probably got the Wikipedia oh, uh, page. Oh, yeah, up. so it's uh, been used in The Mummy. Um, it's been... Actually, I do not have the Wikipedia page wow. up, but it has uh, Kingdom of Heaven, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, so really, whenever they need a desert, frankly, um, it tends to be the one to go to. Yeah, well, like a cool... Di- oh, um, things like Prince of Persia, and yeah, there's loads of things. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the proper name of the city, which is is bad. It's alt something. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it is effectively now, it's basically a, a town that tourists go to and film locations go to. Um, but also, because of it, around there, there is a giant studio that has been built in the area um, that is specifically for the filming of movies. Um, and that is in the, the area that it's in is called Wazazel. And I'm going to probably pronounce that incredibly wrong. Um, please correct my pronunciation in the comments. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and, and effectively, there's actually three big film studios there. And at the minute, all three film studios are pretty much taken up with filming at Gladiator 2. They had loads of trucks and things outside them. So basically, I'll take some photos of these things. I took some photos of the new um, Gladiator Coliseum. Uh, and some photos of the film studios. They've got this giant castle they've built at one of them and stuff, and that's what I've, we've put on Instagram. And, yeah, it's been getting a bit of traction, which it is interesting. It did blow up a bit, although I think it's one of those things when something blows up, people saw a nice location and kind of mass liked it. Well, I think but, as well, because they probably... A lot of people, I think it was because of Gladiator. Yes, yes. Because there was did, a couple um, of comments like people saying, oh, Ridley Scott, Ridley Scott he's so great, and he makes and, great sets and things like that. And yeah, because uh, Kingdom of Heaven uh, was one of his, where he must come back to it fairly frequently mm-hmm. whenever he needs, oh, I need a desert. I've got a desert. I've got a desert in my back pocket. It's quite interesting, actually. They were talking about... So at the front of it, there's the original entrance, which is actually what they used. But actually for Lawrence of Arabia, they built this giant new entrance. Of and course. actually, apparently on top of the new entrance... The new entrance is still there. It was built in the 50s. Um, but on top of the new entrance, they don't let people change that one now permanently. They don't let anyone... So if anyone builds things now there, they have to knock it down and rebuild it. But there's... Um, on top of that, they built uh, Cersei in uh, Game of Thrones. There was a thing where she was on top of a, a 
tower and they built a new towers around there there was quite a lot of game of thrones film there actually as well um it was quite interesting so the, the guide that showed us round, um he has been in like pretty much like because what happens is that, uh, one of the reasons they really like this area for morocco other than that it's got beautiful desert and really different types of buildings and and there's even some new things like this area they've built you know you get those giant solar arrays where you get um like they're not even solar powers panels they're like mirrors you get like a thousand big mirrors in a circle and then you get a thing in the middle and it yes. puts the electric so they, that, they people have used that for filming locations things as well they've got the biggest one in the world there so kind of stuff like that when you go in the i don't think it was used for blade runner 2049 although maybe it was um but when it comes in at the start of that there's they, they go over like five of these solar arrays and yeah they've got the biggest one in the world for that there but what they also like is um in that in that area of Morocco and in Morocco in general, there's quite a, a you know, mixture of population there. There's um, from different parts of Africa and there's a lot of Barber people. There's a lot of um, Arabs and there's lots. Of, you know, there's a real mix of of um, so culturally it's very there. diverse. Yeah, so they can again if they want different extras and different styles, they can just go and put a casting call out and like a thousand extras are sharp. So it's really easy for them to get three thousand extras. Uh, and there was, yeah, but anyway, the, the the guy that showed us around was one of the guys that have been in the, uh, still lives in the village, his family still lives in the village. Um, and they say when they do these big filming things, people come and stay in the village to... to he like, must be raking it in. Well, I felt, I, <laughs> I think he might be. But they were saying they like going and set tents up on the roof of all these buildings and things because there's nowhere else for them to go. So there's a, a thousand Pretty people amazing. just sleeping there. Yeah, That's it was amazing. Quite and they had, he, when you go in one of the rooms, they had photos of all this, all this stuff. So it was really interesting. Um, but yeah, because of that, we asked a question this week. What location that is used many a time in films? And I was thinking there's a diner that they always use in in LA for every film ever. Yeah, it? so Heat, uh, there's that one diner where that's the one where Robert De Niro and Al Pacino mm -hmm. have their famous conversation. And it's been used in um, like 500 Days in the Summer and a bunch of other films. I don't think it's even a diner anymore. I think it's now used I think as it's a, just filming a film location. location. I think it was once a diner yeah. when, when he, certainly when Heat was around. So yeah, there's, so that was the question was what, what kind of lo what location or place do you like seeing in things? And we had some, so we had some replies on this Post, yes. but I think only one of them was actually answering the question. Yes, yes. Um, we had a few people sort of tagging their friends in, saying, oh, look how pretty this is, that kind of stuff. Just um, heart emojis and things like that. But we did have friend of the show, um, Dog Brain Video. He chose the Roman Colosseum. Guess which film, though, he chose? Yeah, I did see, you know, it's like, for fuck's sake. Jumper. <laughs> Hayden Christensen masterpiece. You remember Jumper? Remember, remember when Hayden Christensen. You remember when Hayden Christensen tried to bank on the fact like I've been in Star Wars films. Why am I not a movie star? He said, I'll make my big play for a movie. Big masterpiece, blockbuster action. Oh no, it's flops. No one went to see it. But no one we thought except for Dog Brain Video. Yes, Dog Brain Although videos. he did write lol after it, so Yeah. Most people write lol defensively. <laughs> No one who writes lol is actually lolling. Crying, more like it. <laughs> Inside, anyway. I'm calling you out, dog brain. Anyway, um, what is your favourite location? I went for something uh, more respectable. It's no, more for one so. well, big well, I'll film. Be the judge of that. Um, Salzburg and how it's used in um, The Sound of Music. Okay. It's just lush. I, I, when I thought, when you asked the question, I kind of had a flashback. You know how in... Uh, uh, ratatouille when he eats the mm. chunk of ratatouille go, whoo, 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 and he is brought back to childhood that was the kind of one location that has kind of always stuck with me the way that city is shot in that film and the whole von trapp family story and i thought that is a location mm. what about yourself i just fucking love coney island well i love one. that kind of like area around nathan's hot dogs or around the wonder wheel or in you know so many cool. I, I love New Yorkers. I, I always say if you put a film in New York and shoot it well, or you put a film in Hong Kong and you shoot it well, or you put a film in Tokyo and you shoot it well, I'm probably going to like the film even if it's shit because I just love those locations and cities. But I think that is one area that's used a bit less than some others, like Wall Street things used all the time where the bull is and stuff, but like used a little bit less. But just, yeah, I think it looks really visually cool. And it's kind of half like run down and half not. And, and it looks like that in real life. Like it really, when you go there, it looks very similar. No. And I think it's good as well because it's on the coast. You get kind of nice, cool magic hour shots, and you get like in um, Requiem for Dream, like the pier that goes That's out and stuff. A and... Very fantastic uh, shot. Uh, it reminds me of how um, Spike Lee shoots Bed Stuy, mm -hmm. um, like uh, you know those colourful, um, you know, 
block houses in uh, Do the Right Thing. It, it's kind of grotty, but also he finds some sort of beauty, beauty in it. Beauty in it, yeah. And I like that. But I find the same thing like in the UK and coastal towns. Obviously, at the minute, Margate is obviously becoming a bit like the Coney Island of England. Pretty much almost. Hollywood. Yeah, exactly. They seem to be shooting everything there. Um, and again, it's got an old rundown thumb fair and a weird some weird modern buildings next to old buildings and Turner always said it had the best light in Europe. Next they have to make so. a good movie there. Oh! <laughs> what? Shots fired. Yeah, to be fair, um, apparently the Dreamland series with Lily Allen's good. Oh, yes, but I it was like, seen that. It was like the worst season of Killing Eve was shot there. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst Sam Mendes film Sam for, Mendes for some time. Film. And then that weird film that was called Exodus, where they burnt an Anthony Gormley yes. statue. Well, there have been a few indie movies there, yeah, like yeah. Uh, Jellyfish and things like that. You know, festival favourites that kind of aren't really Starfish seen. Men. Oh, T- yeah. TV pilot. Yeah. Calling you out, Dog Brain. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like Starfish Men. Go and watch it on Dog Brain videos, YouTubes, or start, just type Starfish Men pilot. Into give him a YouTube. nice comment. Send, yeah. Say we sent you. Uh, give him a like. Anyway. He needs it. After all that <laughs> wrecking on Dog Brain videos... Um, yeah, let's is get into news the time? news time because we've this has been a very long. Um, oh, and we didn't say go and follow the socials as oh, well. Oh yes, yeah. gosh, we yes, that's usually <laughs> untitled film podcast. One word: Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Now bugger off. Good. Right, I feel like it's quick news. Quick news time today. So, Callum, what is your first piece of news? Well, a lot of news has been truncated by the fact that everything has halted in LA because of the um, Writers Guild of America strike. Like. I was looking on Deadline, as we usually do, and pretty much everything was, this show is stopped filming. This show is stopped filming. This movie is stopped filming. So news was a bit hard to come by. So if it sounds a bit meh this week, it's mm. because of that. Uh, but the Cannes Film Festival was recently, and they announced their big winners. Um, so the uh, Palm Door went to Anatomy of a Fall, and it's got a lot better reviews. Is that about you? <laughs> Wait a minute. What's that even mean? <laughs> uh, um... This throwing me off a bit. <laughs> but apparently it's a lot better than... Um, um, what was that film last year? Um, Something of Sadness. Um, the one with the boats that sank. Oh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Triangle of Triangle Sadness. Triangle Which Sadness. I really wanted to see and I haven't seen yet. And actually. it got kind of... You know, it got a bit kicked around town by some people. It wasn't Some loved. people loved it. It was some a bit of a Marmite movie. Did. Which is um, what quite often does well at Cannes. And, and this one did a lot better. Really like, um, re- reviews is a, a lot stronger. And also we have the first Jonathan Glazer film in a bunch of years. Quite a few years. Hugely um, well reviewed, and also uh, won the second big winner, Grand Prix, the Zone of Interest. It's a Holocaust movie, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that because a Jonathan Glazer film is a celebration. I'm not going to go through all of them just because it'll, you know, it's quite a few winners here. But um, if you want to check that out, you can. It looks like a lot of interesting uh, art house films are just on the horizon. I was also going to talk about Cannes, so I will just say a very quick thing. I'm quite excited for. The new Wes Anderson film, Asteroid City, which I think looks fun. We've talked about it on the podcast before, but I think looks good fun and seem to get good, if not stellar, reviews, like four out of five, which is probably what you expect with a Wes Anderson film, unless it's Royal Tenenbaums. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but yeah, so that is exciting. Um, I will move on to my singular piece of news, if you're even that. Uh, there is a new trailer out for... Barbie! Um It's coming out in theatres soon. We now actually know kind of what happens um, in it where she starts to realise that maybe her life's fake and not real and that she needs to push out of her comfort zone and go to the real world. And then people start realising there's a Barbie and a Ken in the real world and all hell breaks loose. I think the campaign to get Ryan Gosling a Best Supporting Actor nomination starts now. <laughs> the memes. Maybe it would even be memes. supporting. Could be, I, I don't yeah, know how it, big the role is. It, it depends how big the role is, certainly. But yeah, that's exciting. Uh, Callum, you're, you're our final piece of news today. It's a bit of a weird one. Um, do you remember that show with Daniel Radcliffe, Miracle Workers? Yeah. Season kind of. four I never watched it. came out, um, the first episode that, uh, started airing, I believe, back in March of January, and then it stopped. And TBS put out an announcement, we're finding another location, another time slot. So it hasn't moved location. It's not like um, Minx, which got abruptly cancelled about two thirds of the way through filming season two. They just stopped it. And for months went quiet. Nothing on the social media, nothing anywhere. 
And people were starting to say, is this some sort of tax write-off? Is this like Batgirl? Mm. Uh, is this I think gonna, Disney's doing yeah, that. Yeah. Is, is, is this going to get kind of put deleted in an archive? And they've just announced, oh, we're going to put it out in, in July. But frankly, I'll believe it when I see it. But it was just a weird thing. It started airing. The first episode of season four had just come out. And that's when they said, nah, we're going to stop this. And we're going to find another time slot. So something weird is going on at TBS. I'm not sure what. They're being very hush-hush, because even on the Deadline article, they were very much a case of, well, we just wanted to find a, a better time slot that, that will be good for this show. The best time sh- slots, unless you direct, have direct competition, mm. is any time of the year. But then maybe that is that they had, maybe there was something on around the same time on another network or something they thought, maybe they're a bit a embarrassed time, about that. Or, or maybe there was You something... would have thought they would have sorted that out first, though. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe they thought, oh, it's a crowded, there's a lot of stuff. Because obviously at the minute with TV and something that's been big this week, there's been four or five big shows finishing. And actually yes. three or four of them have been comedies. Um, so Got Ted Barry Lasso. And Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso, Barry and Miss Maisel. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe they thought, oh, it's a bit crowded. We're not, I think if we wait not out to a quieter time, we'll get better for viewing this figures. mildly liked show that yeah, exactly. is well liked, but, you know, doesn't bring the house down because i don't know like i think everyone's different but i think i tend to have like one show that's bingeable at a time plus like two or three shows that are coming out kind of weekly um yeah and i can't really do I'm, any I'm more than that same. so yeah. it's just maybe there's maybe they were like well actually we think we'll get better and figures it, than yeah, this. We think it's going, we're going to get lost at the moment in the in the noise or something it was but very weird it's though. a weird decision people don't usually do that unless they can like cancel it or retool exactly. it or, or one of the cast members has done something sketchy or yes like uh, Danny Masterson from um, that 70s show so yes that doesn't look good yeah, yeah. It looks pretty horrible anyway we won't go into that too much detail yes. <laughs> so um, yeah so on skimming to... over the news a bit because our first bit was a bit long joint news as yeah, well yeah so a joint, a joint news with the can news there so, Callum, we're going to talk about a couple of movies this week, as ever. And um, what are the movies, the new one and the old? Well, the new one has just come out on Apple TV+, and it's directed by Benjamin Caron. It's called Sharper. It's a, it's a, a con man movie. Uh, it's been a little while since we've seen one of those, and we wanted to pair it with uh, something quite noir maybe neo-noir rather than classic noir. So we went for Christopher Nolan's Memento, and we thought it would be good to do that because we're always giving Christopher Nolan a bit of a kicking. And, and this and is one of probably his better movies. One of his better movies. Let this do the talking for him. Mm-hmm. Kind of let give him a chance to defend himself a bit. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the he's, ratings he gets on IMDb doesn't need much defending. He's devastated but... <laughs> by the fact that we, we give him a kicking. <laughs> Okay. I think as well, we don't necessarily give him a kicking. We give the fact that he's held in quite as high regard as he is. Yeah, a kicking. I think so. Yeah, they're kind like of. Um, if, if he was a like. Smart, a, a dumb person, smart movie. Yeah, I feel like if, if people were like. Uh, if he was held in the same esteem as Denis Villeneuve or something, which is, you know, is, is up there as one of the better directors out there, but not seen as like the single greatest thing that's ever happened to big budget cinema, which is what he seems to be seen as. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Um, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> so. Uh, I'll do the honours on Sharper. Yeah, sure. I? Okay. Yeah, if you want to. So has anyone out there, Callum, maybe you have, seen that episode of Rick and Morty where what they do is they take the piss out of heist movies? Yes, a while ago. That's this movie. <laughs> That's all I need to <laughs> tell you. Good comparison. <laughs> <laughs> Hadn't thought of that. Um, so you, you've got, it starts off with um, just, is it Justice, Justice Smith? Smith, One yes. of the Smiths. He's not one of the Smiths. Is he not one of the Smiths? No, he's just... He is in thing. Is he's, he... he's been around for a while. Ah, uh, he... He's Detective uh, Pikachu. He is in Is he in... Is he in with an actual Smith in that, um, the get down? He may have been, yes. Anyway, Justice Smith. It's a bit confusing. And I can't remember the actress's name. Come on, IMDb. I loved you um, in IMDb. <laughs> Brian, Brianna Mil- Middleton. Brianna Middleton. Um... They, he, he owned, Justice Smith owns a bookshop and she turns up one day and they, they hit it off. They go for drinky poos. And then one day he finds her crying, sobbing, sad as a sad person. I don't know what analogy I was going for there. Um, yeah, I'm wondering that. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, and she says, oh, my brother, he owes $350,000 to some horrible criminal 
um, and they're going to break his knees if they don't have if they don't give it to me. And he goes, Justice Smith goes, well, my dad's some rich guy and I don't really like him, so I'll give you $350,000 easy. Just like that, lickety split. And he does. And then he turns up at her house one day and she's gone, 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 gone. Cuts to a title card with someone else's name and it's the girl, but it's not the girl anymore, the woman, I should say, really. The girl's a bit doggity. Um... It's the woman, but she, it's not the woman as you know her, it's her as a drug addict and she's been shaken down by her, um, what's the word, her parole officer. And this guy comes over and offers her a, a, a seven thousand, or the parole officer of $7,000 watch to, uh, to leave her alone. And then you find out the watch is a fake. And then you find out that he's taught her all these things and how to act this way and, um, and then cut to finding out he, the guy that's done that, is um, something to do with Julia Moore, who's with John Lithgow in some relationship. And anyway, it just goes on like that for about two hours. I mean, I, yeah, I'll tell you what I think of it in a minute, but it goes on like that for two hours. It just keeps, um, you keep finding more and more about these people and they're a bit more intertwined and twisted than you think. Throughout that whole introduction, <laughs> I was kind of blinded by rage, rage by the fact that you use drinky poos. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was kind of listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's quite hard. Again, I feel like I've, well, I seem I to think, pick the heart. I mean, how would you explain no, it? No, to be fair, you are right. It's because um, it, like this genre, mm-hmm. it's meant, it's deliberately twisty. It, it ties itself up in knots. And actually, I think an issue with this movie is it might go one or two or maybe even three or four not too deep. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, So it it is a hard movie to describe. You either have to under-describe it or you end up having to go, and then this person does that thing who's connected to that person, which is what... Which is why my, I think my description at first, but I had to go a bit further because you may have not seen that Rick and Morty episode, but is that Rick and Morty episode where they talk about (laughs) But this kind of movie, it, it does have one of those plots where you go... And then this person gets involved with that person and ties up with that person and you do mm-hmm. end up kind of tripping over yourself. You're like, hang on, did that one know that one? When did that happen in the timeline? Yes, exactly. I have to say, though, because maybe for nostalgic reasons where we don't get mid-budget films mm-hmm. made for adults that are shot in nice glossy cities with a bunch of movie stars who are clearly glad to be not doing TV CGI or CGI explosions or, yeah. or television, kind of likes it. Um, for the most part. I think, like we said, it ties itself up into about five knots too deep. Does. But I liked watching them interplay in very glossy, almost ad, um, perfume adverts mm. looking uh, stuff. I, it's funny you say that about we don't get those mid-budget movies anymore. I was about halfway through and I thought this film would have been made in the 90s. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> this, like, even the, cine- the, the camera work and things, I was like, it's I was... got enough money. Like, if you'd made this now, it wouldn't have enough money to look this good. It would be on Netflix yeah. and look the same. It felt so like it was made in the 90s. I was even coming up with the cast of who would yes, have been in the film in the mid-90s. I said, okay, so John Cusack would be <laughs> yeah. Justice Smith. Yeah. Julianne Moore would still be in the Julianne film. Moore. But she'd, she'd be, be, the, dr- yeah, she'd be yeah, the drug yeah, addict. Yeah, yeah. Um, Richard Gere maybe would be the Sebastian stan character and you know I, that's what i was doing throughout mm-hmm. this whole movie and so i i was kind of for a moment transported i've been a lot of transporting me back to youth but uh <laughs> in this episode nostalgia has really hit me here um but i have found myself kind of liking it for the fact that we they buy gum they don't make them like that anymore mm. maybe they should have never made them like that because those kinds of films weren't even the prime films of their day they would have been the films where Basic Instinct was a massive hit. Mm-hmm. And so every studio, studio in the, the land, instinct, they wanted yeah. the Basic Instinct. I did instinct. think this is a poor man's Basic Instinct. Exactly, exactly. Or, you know, um, uh, American Gigolo or something like that. It's the kind of film that you'd watch uh, on a TV channel like at 11pm on a Friday night after the news because, you, oh, you, you know, you're a 14-year-old kid and it's... it's yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's 20, 2004 and that film came out in 1997 and then you go into school on... Next week, I saw this film on the weekend. It was pretty good. Yeah, if you get a chance, you should watch it. That's, and that's all that's you'd ever think exactly about. Exactly what I thought. Or you'd be in a charity shop and you'd see the spine of that VHS, and you go, "Oh yeah, I remember that." And the spine's a bit warped. It's a bit sun bleached. Mm-hmm. But no, for all of its kind of convolutions, its uh, its cliches, I kind of found myself going along with it up until about, and we can't reveal anything. 
about the last half an hour where I found myself going, oh, come on. I actually didn't mind the ending in a way. There was a one thing I really didn't like about it. But I think they needed to take a couple of knots out before it got to... I think if you'd have cut... If you'd have de-dramatised the ending slightly and then cut out the previous couple of knots and shut it in, then I think it might have worked better. But yeah, uh, I think one of the big issues with it is I don't think, and it's something that the film we're going to talk about in a minute does in a much better way, I don't think it really ever does a very good job of establishing where in the timeline certain things are because it's kind of a flash forward at the start, but it's not a flash forward all the way to the start. And then the ending is after that's happened, but how far, you know, you don't quite know how far things are. It's, it, again, it, obviously, I think they, the directors had seen Memento as well, and they thought, oh, yeah, a bit of non-linear time bending in here, but again, the loops don't connect up. So I, do, I, think, I think I'm quite similar to you. I think it's a mess of a film, and a mess that I don't necessarily mind. Like, I think I like, I like the actors... I like the way it's put together overall. I like. I think it's shot quite well. I think it's fun to an extent, but I think it's, as I always say, 20 minutes, half an hour too long. Yeah. Two knots too long and maybe gets a bit dramatic at the end and could do a little bit better of, of placing its timeline slightly more obviously. Well, I think it deliberately turns itself episodic because uh, each chapter is... Um, fronted by a title card with the name of the character yeah. and then it follows them for about 20 minutes and it did make it feel like a mini series. I thought that as well but and that's what the other the other problem I had is I thought well you could have done them you could have done the fleshed out the 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 each grift better and had it as a mini series each episode maybe even oh yeah, the problem with the mini series is you would want 45 minute episodes but for, if it did 30 minute episodes it would have worked as like a six part mini series. But the way they've done it, some of them, I think it was wildly inconsistent. Some of them would take 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and then some bits would be like 10 minutes. Like the first, first grift is only 10 minutes long, and yes. then the next one is like 20 minutes long, and then the next one's 40 minutes long. And then, then it feels like it gives up with the title card thing at some point along the way it as well. It did seem to, and then it remembers yeah. the, for the very last one. You go, oh, God, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's, it's like, is this bit 45 minutes long, or have they forgotten a couple of title cards, or where is it in this situation right now? Yeah, it, it is. I think it's a mess. I think that's the problem. And I quite like a mid-budget mess sometimes. Me too. I mean, like I said, it reminded me of films and fond memories of watching films, you know, at, in my parents' house, uh, in the living room at 9pm, like you said, on a Channel 4 on a, on a rainy day or something. And i got to say, for that reason, I kind of have fond feelings towards this film. You know, flaws aside, I, I found myself enjoying it sort of despite itself. Mm. Yeah, I think so. And I think, like you say, the fact that they don't make this film anymore, this type of film, yeah. it's quite nice just to see it. I mean, you watch this film and you go, buy gum, buy gum, you say. They don't make them like that anymore. No. Did you say buy gum? No, I didn't say buy gum. Well, then you didn't watch it pr properly. I then. did say drink a poos, though. So. Oh, yes, you did. Yeah, I'm still angry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Step down from Holly Bobs, though. You were there. <laughs> just got back from my Holly Bobs and saw some sets while I was there. Mm -hmm. He's twirling his hair, listeners. But yeah, anyway, um, yeah, I think I think it's fine. Yeah, it's a, a likable, <laughs> charming, fine, fine movie. Yeah. Once again, Apple does the thing of not having a piece of utter shite on it. Yeah, they, who they, knew? Like they, everything on Apple Plus ranges from being very, very severance level good, slash season one of Ted Lasso and things, down to middle, like three star. And they don't really do anything lower than that. They they have managed to somehow get the... Because, oh my God, some of the shit on Netflix that I they mean, produce. they courted some of the bigger directors and that's mm. when you get kind of mad stuff like Servant, which is like, what's, what, what's going on in this show? But was it bad? No, it well, fascinating. Mm. Some episodes are terrible. Some episodes are brilliant. Some episodes are brilliant, followed by a terrible, followed by a brilliant episode. And you go, just calm down, this show. <laughs> kind of liking it, though. I'm, I'm not giving up on it. God, that was awful. Not giving up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And I think, so fair play to Apple. Oh, absolutely. They have ambition. I think so. And I think, um, yeah. I actually think, I was thinking about this, what, you know, everyone's, everyone's credit crunch, cost of living crisis, whatever they call it at the minute. It's not credit crunch. That was the last one, which I always thought sounded like a cereal. Um, they, uh, I, I mean, oh, maybe I'll get rid of some of my sub many, many, many subscriptions. And I have to admit, Netflix was the first one. I'm like, I can't remember the last time something I was really excited about came out on Netflix. 
And I really can't remember the last time something I was really excited about came out on Netflix and then they didn't cancel it pretty quickly afterwards. And then you're only keeping something because it's the only streaming service that has that yeah, exactly. long-running show. And then Netflix lost a bunch of them. I know. I think that, like, the one thing that keeps me with Netflix is I just don't like the thought of not having Bojack Horseman. Because I just do love Bojack Horseman. But I just think it's... I think it's the one that I'm going to go... Every time I look on them, I'm just like, nothing, nothing, nothing. Crime documentary, I might put that under the background. But there's nothing. There's never anything exciting I haven't had there. Netflix for months now. I just can't be bothered. There's not much on there yeah. anymore. Um, but yeah, every, every time I kind of think about cancelling Apple, there's a new show that comes... Like, I want to see apparently that new... Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, curly hair guy, popular comedy... Uh, just uh, Seth Rogen. Oh, yes. Oh, the one with uh, Rose Byrne. Yeah. Apparently that's really, really good. Platonic. Yes. You basically described every comedian in Hollywood. <laughs> well, <laughs> say what you will. Jewish, curly hair. I didn't say Jewish. Uh, you know, you know, about five, between five foot eight and, and six foot, you know, um, you know, popular, makes people laugh. Well, Speaks I feel English. like Seth Rogen is probably like the most popular comic actor at the moment. Maybe. Adam no, he's certainly within a... Adam Sandler's not got curly hair. Well, yeah. He's within a top group, certainly. So, anyway. Uh, and also, how many of them have just got a TV series that's just come out on Apple you, Plus? Well, maybe not Apple Plus, but usually some of them have. They've got something out in the pipeline. Wow. Well, anyway. So, yeah, if you haven't got Apple Plus, this is an unpaid for advertisement. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but speaking of advertisements, here's some paid ones. And welcome back. That segue <laughs> was something else. I think it was a masterpiece. That was pretty good. Yeah. Um, but Apple, seriously, if you do want to give me free Apple Plus or even some money, I would really like money, but a free Apple Plus, that would be excellent. Um, but yeah, Callum, what is our second movie? We have mentioned it already, but remind the listeners, what is our second movie of the week? Yes, so our second movie is the second feature film by uh, Christopher Nolan. So by this point, he had done uh, Following, and he made his big play to make a small kind of indie film, but with American money. And this was his kind of big calling card to the bigger studios to kind of potentially give him more. And so it's Memento, starring Guy Pearce as a man named Leonard, his wife has previously, sometime in the past, been raped and murdered, and he's trying to track down the person who done it. So in the start of the film, he is pointing a gun at the head of Joe Pasquiliano. Well, um, no, something else previous to that is happening. Which, which bit was that? At the start of the film, he's shaking the Polaroid. Oh, yes, yes, so yes, so the, you have the Polaroid. So that uh, during the, the opening credit sequence, you've got the Polaroid. There's, Polaroid. there's a picture of the Polaroid has a dead person on it, but then that is going in reverse. Uh, yes, and, and, it's fading. and that's kind of a clue of what is about to come. Because this story, starting with uh, Joe Pasquiliano, goes backwards. And so the revelations don't come at the end, they come at the start. So it ends with who he thinks is the person who raped and murdered his wife. And it's going backwards. And the reason why it's told in this way is because since that event, he was hit in the head as he tried to tried to save her. And he was hit in the head, it smashed into a mirror. And so he has short-term memory loss. He can't make new memories. So he's always having to piece together what exactly is going on. So the story is going backwards. And then that it is a dual narrative Throughout the whole film, the, all the uh, expositionary dialogue is delivered on the phone to someone. He kind of doesn't know who's called him, but he's telling the story of his life, of his accident, this condition, why it is that he has a system in play to remember things. It's revealed later on that he's covered in tattoos and it tells him all the things he needs to know, the person's license plate, remember Sammy Jankis, and that becomes important. And then during that dual narrative, he starts telling the story of a man named Sammy Jankis, who had the same condition as him. Because in a previous life, before he went on this vengeance spree, he was insu um, did insurance claims, and he had to kind of sniff out when people were lying. And Sammy Jankis, he had this condition, and he just didn't believe him. Or at least when he started to believe him, he didn't believe that because of the conditions, he thought that he should be able to make new memories. And so he brushed them off. So he has this great guilt over this, what he did to this person. And so those two narratives at the end of the film, one going forward, one going backwards, they tie themselves into a knot. 
and maybe things aren't quite as they seem. So, Johnny, what did you think of Christopher Nolan's Memento? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, it's probably it's one of the first times that Chris Nolan is playing with time which is obviously one of his staples. And I think in that regard, it is one of the simpler ones. And I think because of that, it's, it's for the better. I think it works, the narrative, yeah, the way the so. structure of the narrative works really well. Um, it's really well signposted which part of the narrative you're in by black and white and colour. And you realise that you're obviously watching each piece on the main narrative in reverse. So you'll see a piece of what's happened and then it'll end with normally with something that's almost like a... Like a, like a lead into it. Yeah, or a lead into cliffhanger. And then it'll cut to him talking to this person, which is obviously going forward in time. Um, and then it'll cut back to the old piece, and then it'll cut back to that, and then it'll cut back to the old piece. And at some point, they overlap. So there's a bit where he's you find out that he said to them, don't let anyone call in, and he realises that that's a problem. And then the, black, then the black and white piece stops, and then you start kind of seeing more of the current time but yeah it's a very clever way that they'll they'll show you a bit going forward in time but only a bit of it and then you'll cut to the, the that narrative and then you'll go back and then so i think the way that it's done is very smart you don't have to think too much but it's you have to think a bit and you have to kind of work out what's going on so i think that's one of, one of the, th the traits where chris nolan certainly used to be very good at and now i think he's a bit blunt whacking you around the head with a bat kind of think about this thing but he, he used to be quite smart in that he didn't treat his audience like idiots um but he would do interesting things at the same time i think insomnia is like that as well and you know there's quite a few that that uh, are, are quite good fun in that way um i think it's all acted very well i think the characters are believable again it's small cast very well tight-knit put together um it, and it's compelling it, it, it sucks you in you want to know what happened because you always get these like mini episodes where it cuts between it and it's going backwards in time you really it's like when it cuts to the second timeline you know the, the, the black and white timeline you're like oh no go back to the other one I want to find out what happened before that and stuff but obviously the, the exposition is also very important as well of him talking on the phone so no I think it's 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 very smart it's engaging it's well acted it's fairly well shot obviously it's quite low budget it feels to me anyway um certainly below mid budget i think it's something like six or seven million yeah and it feels it which is you know 20 million these days equivalent but yeah it's still you know that's a small budget um but yeah, it works very well oh absolutely um i think uh well like you said the his fascination with time would continue but <laughs> it's not nearly as kind of well it's we've not used, obnoxious yeah obnoxious and, and kind of overly complicated like a like with a Dunkirk, we go, wait a minute, where are we now? We're on the beach or when the planes, two hours, two days, you know, okay, which one, which, which one's this one? All right. So, okay. So wait, hang about, where, where are we? It doesn't have to have ticking clocks everywhere yeah, as well to like clocks, remind you that there's time moving. Uh, so, you know, it's not nearly as obnoxious. And like you said, it has visual cues in order to kind of play up. Uh, okay. We're here. Okay. We're here. And it's, it's a simple story. It's, um, you know, it's a, Another fascination of Christopher Nolan, Dead Wives. Mm, but um, very true. <laughs> I forgot about that. This is his first one. This is his first Dead Wife. Um, and it's a simple revenge narrative with a clever gimmick. And it's well written. It's tightly wound. Um, what it doesn't have is the chilliness of later Christopher Nolan, mm. where he gets a bit cold. And he's so fascinated with chess pieces and where they're placed on a board that he forgets he's dealing with humans mm -hmm. and you know it's very his films can be often accused of being quite frosty there was like kind of like the, at times the dialogue can get towards wes anderson or, yeah yeah <laughs> like, almost people staring at the camera blankly explaining the plot to you i mean and, anyone who's seen tenant fucking hell that yeah. scene with um with uh david washington and um well i'll try to keep up yeah and and michael kane fuck me yeah fucking hell yeah um, yeah, so it's not nearly as chilly. You have a compelling lead in Guy Pearce, who's an excellent, uh, frankly, underutilized actor these days. He and, is, yeah, um, I was thinking that was He has it. a warmth to him, um, which kind of keeps you going. You believe in his pursuit of vengeance. Um, you believe in his guilt over what he did to Sammy and Sammy's uh, wife. Uh, you believe in, in uh, Carrie Ann Moss, is someone who is 
has a kind of femme fatale sort of thing going on. But, mm-hmm. but you know, even even she has something going on. Um, Joe Pasquiliano, he played a lot of those snaky sort of characters in the 90s. Again, where did he go? Um, and, uh, he hasn't been around forever. Uh, but he played those kind of um, kind of slightly greasy, slightly snaky, you know, had a con, well, a con man sort of thing. He, he has a, something like this in The Matrix and a few other films. He just had a kind of oily presence mm-hmm. to him. And he makes for someone who... You know, he's set up to be an antagonist, but is he? And he sells that very well because he is that kind of actor. Um, so, no, I think all the pieces that should be at play here are it's clever without being overburdened with how clever it is. And it's the exposition, because it's told in the dual narrative of him on the phone, it doesn't get to that uh, inception or tenet level of people just, like like you said, a Wes Anderson film, people explaining the plot to each other in nice suits in restaurants. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean this. You mean that? Yes, I mean that. It, it drips it to you in an interesting way that makes you want to know more. It doesn't explain it to you. They're quite mansplainy. Yes. Uh, if I was to use a term. Yes. <laughs> because Nolan films these days, and it's not. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like a... I like the jangly score as well. Yeah. The sequences, it puts you on edge because... Where did this phone call come from? Why is he on the phone? Mm. Who is he talking to? And that, and why of course, is he telling them his whole life story? His whole life story, and it gets fed to you, and that's interesting as well. It's it's probably his best screenplay, at least solo screenplay, because he's done a few. Yeah. Although with J- his Jonathan brother. Nolan came it's, up with the idea for his story. Yes, by. it's based on the story, but it couldn't be nominated for best adapted screenplay because the story wasn't published until after the film came out. Oh, I think that's that's why. So it was nominated for uh, original screenplay, um, but it. So as a solo screenplay, um, it's it's easily his best. Something else, it's about an hour and 50 minutes long. It's not it's good length. three and a half hours like Chris Nolan movies yeah. can be these days. Just because you have more money doesn't mean you should use it. Exactly. No, I, I, I do wonder sometimes if some of the hammy dialogue is more a Jonathan Nolan thing than a Chris Nolan thing, because the dialogue in this is pretty perfect. Yeah. Um, no, I think it is... I don't know if it's his best film. Um, and the reason I say that is it's not... I suppose it depends what you think a director should be. He does a very good job of getting good direction out of his actors, and it's a good script, but the script's obviously more a writer thing than a director. I know he does both, but it's a bit more of a writing thing than a directing thing. But actually, the direction toolbox is quite basic. It's one bit's black and white, one bit's colour. This one he hasn't yet full-bloomed into the Christopher Nolan mega-director that we would come to know. And I think that is one of the things that I enjoy about Chris Nolan films. I do like a good set piece. Um, And I think that's one of the things that sets him... It's not his scripts that set him apart from other people. Well, quite. It's... You know, the, the stories are good, but the scripts can be quite clunky, especially in a dialogue point of view. Which is why there should be a caveat to Christopher Nolan's best screenplay, Asterix. Yeah, not saying necessarily a great deal on its own. No, exactly. So it's it's quite an interesting one. I think it's probably his most well-rounded movie. I think that's a good way to describe it. But I don't know if it's his best work because it is it what he's best at is actually Batman Begins his best work or is actually I don't want to say Inception. I think Inception's a bit all over the place at times, but visually Inception is incredible. It's certainly the last act. Or is it Dunkirk, which again, while the, the time device thing's a bit clunky, it's a very good story told very well and it's really well shot. And again, every actor plays their part very well. And so, or, or actually Prestige gets quite under, people forget about the Prestige, which I like I think Prestige has like picked a up a cult audience because mm, at the time like it, it was sort of liked... But now, like, if you go anywhere, it's usually the first one that people mention. Yeah, it is. It is it's quite good fun, isn't it? It's quite, it's just interesting and fun. And, and, and I don't think, I think because of the actors they've got in it, actually, they don't stiffen up with his dialogue. Whereas it's also I think, based on a book. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, he isn't so burdened with having to come up with a story on his own. Exactly. So now, again, so you, is it the best Chris Nolan movie? I would probably argue not. Is it the most well-rounded Chris Nolan movie? That's what I would describe yeah, it as. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think that's fair. And, and it is fairly basic in the direction. He's still learning. He's mm-hmm. he's not yet full-bloomed into Christopher Nolan. But he also hasn't got $200 million. Well, that is something, yes. Not that you'd need to spend $200 million on this story. Like, and there's his, no way to do that. His really. next film would be Insomnia, which would bridge that gap. So that would be probably 40, 50, mm-hmm. I'm guessing. And then... 
Batman Begins. I actually really like Insomnia as well. Yeah, it's I've got a good a soft film. spot for Insomnia. Yeah, me too. It's not obsessed with time. It's obsessed with daylight, but not well, time. Yes, yes. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, I think that wraps up our reviews very nicely. So, I Callum, think so. What did you think of Sharper? Sharper. <laughs> Shows you how memorable the film is. Yeah. Um, I was kind of toying with it between a couple of ratings. I think I'll probably have to play it safe and go for six out of ten. It's likable. It's, you know, it's watchable. And it reminds you of the day, the days of yore of the mid 90s when you'd be staying up and something came on ITV and you go, what's this? It's got John Cusack in it. All right, I'll stick with that. Mm. It's all right, isn't it? Um, which isn't the highest praise of nostalgia, but, but <laughs> you know, it's something. It's not bad. Um, I, I'd give it a watch. Six out of 10, solid. Yeah, I think, funnily enough, so I was juggling between two scores in my head which were close to each other five and six i'm also going to go for six but again i think it's a nostalgia thing i think it's that i want to see i quite like seeing these kind of movies they're easy to watch again i always say this thing a plane movie mainly because i'm on planes all the fucking time but like um yeah it's uh it's a plane movie like you don't have to think too much if someone brings you your meal and puts it down in front of you and you take your headphones off a second to say i have the chicken and stuff <laughs> you haven't missed too much yeah. like although it's twisty turny like the twists and turns aren't that important whereas i think if i missed a twist or a turn in insomnia you could be fucked for the rest of the for, well you get back memento. to it. memento that's what i meant yeah well or insomnia yeah it could be yeah <laughs> either one yeah anyway um so yeah, I'm going to agree with you on that one and give it a 6 out of 10. And Callum, Memento, not Insomnia, Memento. I think an 8 out of 10. Um, it's really good. Uh, it's a really well-constructed screenplay, talented cast, and with more warmth than you might accept, uh, accept, uh, expect, expect from a Christopher Nolan film. And good Lord, where are you, Joe? Joe Pasquiliano, come back. We want you back. You're this great. We find that there's some big Me Too movement or oh, something. I hope not. <laughs> I, I gotta hope not. Um, I, that would make me so sad if it was uh, someone like him. I, I covet my character actors like they're made out of gold. Kings am among men, I say. Um, so please don't have a scandal. But yeah, no, it's really good. It, like you said, it's not the best directed. He's still learning his trade, learning his craft. Um, there is better direction later on in his work, but it's a really good calling card. Like this was the one because the following was made for like 10 P in London. Mm -hmm. And this one was like a, a studio had said, okay, come to LA and make a movie here. We'll give you a bit of a budget and some kind of C list stars. Let's see what you can do kid. And by gum, he did it. You know, it's really annoying. I'm going to have to agree with you again. <laughs> I think it's an eight out of 10. I think, yeah, if, if he'd have had $20 million and knew how to film and made it like look really cool, um, then, yeah, maybe it would have been a 9 or a 10. But, but yeah, I, the act, you can't fault the acting. I think he, he, it's the least annoying time he's used his time shtick. And I think because it's the first time it works. Or I the like dead it. wife shtick. Or the dead wife shtick. Or the lead character in fairly nice suit kind yes. of clothing shtick. Um, so that all works. It's not too long, which is a Chris Nolan issue. It's not full of really annoying hammy dialogue. Um, so, yeah, it, but it ke keeps a lot of what's good about a Chris Nolan movie other than some really big, cool set pieces because it doesn't have the budget to do that or the need, really, for the story. So, yeah, I think it's a really solid 8 out of 10. Um, and as I said earlier, I think it's the most well-rounded Chris Nolan movie. I don't think it's the best, but I think it's the most well-rounded. Agreed. Just a, a random question before we okay. end. What is your favourite slash best? Well, what's your favourite and what is the best Chris Nolan um, movie, do you think? Yeah, so because those are two different things. Um, so best would probably be, if not The Prestige, then Inception, just on a term of, by George, they've done it. Mm -hmm. They pulled that off. <laughs> I do remember when it came out, just thinking, bloody hell, someone's let someone make a $250 million thinky movie. Yeah, exactly. Like, how did they pull that off? That's and it's made money. The whole city's folding in on it. So what the... Dude, what the, <laughs> um, but you know there are problems with um, Inception like the first hour is just people talking at each other mm -hmm. so in terms of favourite it might be Memento actually um, it's been a while since I've seen The Prestige I need to give it another watch I think until I do a, a rewatch of The Prestige I think I'm going to have to say Memento currently okay. I would say for me best I would say is possibly Dunkirk because I don't think it's too long 
the time the time clock shtick thing is a bit annoying, but actually I saw it in an IMAX cinema and it made it more intense. It did make it more intense. It kind of worked, which I hate begrudgingly say. <laughs> um, I remember coming out of it and having to go for a drink because I felt like I'd been in a war. It felt like those bullets were cutting through you in the, the IMAX with like the proper Dolby surround sound and stuff. And he, in fairness to the guy, he is really good at that. I like the fact he still carries a torch He's for a film champion and for film for IMAX and proper and, sound and how to use yeah. it and everything like that. So, and I like that. And I think it's a, a good story told well, because that and obviously 1917 both came out at about the same time. And actually, they probably are two of the best World War II movies. I think yeah. they're... Oh, actually, sorry, 1917 is a World War I movie. But they're, they're, they're two of the better World War movies. They're not too triumphant, triumphantist. Is that a word? Let's say it is. Let's say it is. Um, like, they're not too... They, they do show that... Because like, I think that if, when the war first happened and they brought all these movies out, they didn't do a very good job of showing how fucking shit war is. Like, war is the worst thing. Like, war is horrible. Um, I think you... I'm sure everyone knows that. But, like, the movies didn't show it. The movies were like, yeah, we did it. We we put we one up to the smash moon those guys. Jerry's. And that kind of thing. And then you got, then they stopped making those movies for a while and were making Vietnam movies, which actually did do that yes. war is awful kind of thing. And then it was, this was almost like one, one, then they kind of did Private Ryan and stuff, which was like a hybrid between, yes, we'll, we'll do it. We'll go and save that one man. And then somebody gets his brains blown out. So it kind of did a bit of like showing it, but also having a stupid storyline that mm-hmm. would never have happened. And that's not how wars work. And Band of Brothers is somewhere between the two yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. A bit more. And like Iwo Jima's good and stuff. But but they, they were, to me, like two of the first kind of World War movies that really like felt quite well-rounded. And so I really actually respect that movie. Um, but it's probably not my favourite. I'm probably going to go with Prestige. Although Insomniac's up there too. And Memento, they're quite close in my head but i just do i just the fact david bowie's in prestige i mean that's <laughs> well yeah <laughs> for me 10 out of 10 no yeah, exactly, nuts exactly um playing nikola tesla what a role but yeah anyway um i think that probably brings this episode to an end wraps are all up so thank you very much please go on our socials and like some photos and answer some questions and by gum they don't make them like that anymore <laughs> ruin the ending we have to do the whole podcast again now whole thing. okay zero out of ten This one's never seen the light of day. Bye. Later.